Thanks, Nathan. Thanks, Gene, for uh, uh, running a really fascinating um, uh, conference over the last uh, day and a half. And we're happy to welcome you back from uh, your break for a conversation with uh, Roger Martin about, as Nathan said, um, his book, Fixing the Game, which I have here. Uh, I read this book and I thought it was, before I even knew that I'd be um, uh, having this conversation in front of a bunch of people, uh, I read this book and it really struck me because it takes some very, very complicated, almost intractable problems. And over the past day and a half, we've seen no shortage of complicated and practical problems. And as opposed to just simply describing the problem and talking about how difficult it is, Roger actually comes up with a way of understanding the problem first and a way of remedying the problem through a series of prescriptions. So Roger, can you talk about the premise of the book a little bit and what your insights were? Sure, the, the premise really is that the financial volatility and crashes, bubbles and crashes we've had uh, in the last little while, dot-com uh, bubble, bubble and bust and the, the real estate subprime mor mortgage uh, bust are actually not accidental uh, they are a feature of the fundamental design of the modern capital markets and the modern economy, and we're going to get more of that uh, if we don't fix it. Uh, and the the real problem at the at the at the heart of it is that stock prices. People sort of think a stock price is a function of something real. That if you earn a higher higher profit in a given quarter, let's say your stock price will go up. Uh, it isn't. Stock prices are simply the collective expectations of shareholders, investors, about the future of the, of the company. So it's just, a, it's just a collective guess that they're making. Absolutely. And it's a guess about the future. And, it, and you, you, kind of, you know it from, if you, if you know, you know, the S&P 500 has had over its time a multiple. So it trades at 17 times uh, earnings over time, over, over a 100 year period. That means you're being paid once for what's actually happening and 16 times for what you imagine will happen in the future. But the stock market's been around for a long time, so what's new now? What's new now is that uh, until uh, the, the early 80s, executives were compensated on the basis of what was really happening in their company. So if they really made earnings go up, if they really increased market share, if they really increased customer attention, generally speaking, they got bonuses and got paid more. Now, and starting in 1980, they, they were paid uh, on the basis of whether they made the stock price go up. What happened in 1980? Why, why this change? Uh, it was actually 1976 that, a, that an apocal article was written by uh, two, two guys, Mike Jensen and Bill Meckling, that, that, that said the way to get the interests of management aligned with the interests of shareholders is to, is to give them stock-based compensation. Uh, prior to that, if you can believe it, uh, as of that time, less than 1% of large company CEO compensation was stock. But it sounds like a good idea to me. Yeah, that that that's the interesting that that's the interesting thing. It has what I do a lot of work for uh, Procter and Gamble, and they've got this great expression called kitchen logic, <laughs> right? Which if it 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 sort of it's like ba baking soda, like baking soda makes your refrigerator smell better, so it must be good for your teeth too, <laughs> right? That's 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 uh, it, it, it 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 turns out it isn't really uh, very good for your teeth, uh, but it makes sense, and this sort of made sense is <laughs> is get those people aligned. But it turns out that what it's done is gotten uh, executives to focus more on expectations and manipulating expectations and then cashing in on those expectations. And so I, would, I, I argue in the book that all it's done is created more volatility because if you think about it, if you're, if you're getting stock based compensation options or, or, or what's now used deferred stock or restricted stock every year, and if you kind of know when that is, which you do, uh, and you go to Wall Street, if it happens in September every year, where the compensation committee meets, and you go to Wall Street in August and say, oh man, things are tough out there. You get the stock down. September, you get a bunch of options at a low price. And then you go to Wall Street uh, in, uh, in February and say, you know what? It's gotten a lot better. People, don't, awesome. people really do this? Yeah. Shocking. Okay. Yeah. The, the, an, <laughs> the answer is they do. And 
And one of the things, I mean, executives, when I say this, kind of complain to me and, and, and say, we don't do that at all. And I was saying, oh, so, so let me get this straight. So you ignore the compensation system entirely. So if that's true, then the, all the money we're paying you in that compensation system was stupid. That theory doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Right, yeah. Or, and, if, and if you, in fact, do pay attention to the compensation system, you'll do all sorts of things that are terrible for the shareholders. Uh, and so which, which is it, guys? So, so this all sounded abstract <laughs> to me when I, when I sort of started reading your book. But then you come up with this fantastic metaphor that makes it so clear to anyone who is a, I'm not even a football fan, but I understood <laughs> it. So go. So OK. So the, the metaphor is it turns out that a stock price is, is almost identical to a point spread in football. So and explain I, what that is to uh, people, people here, to so, designers who may not be. Uh, may not be NFL uh, <laughs> or college football fans. So, so in, uh, in, in football, the way the betting works is, is if, uh, let's see, uh, the, uh, my beloved Patriots are, are playing the Bears uh, this, this weekend. And in order to even the betting on both sides, they create the bookies in, in Las Vegas create a point spread. And I think New England's probably favored by five points, let's say. So if New England wins by more than five points and you bet on New England, you win. If New England wins by less than five points uh, or, or Chicago wins, uh, you, win, you win the bet. That point spread modifies uh, uh, so that there are, there are the same number of bettors on, on, on either side of the, of, of the bet. It's exactly like a stock price, right? In, in some sense, it, uh, stock prices rise or fall to a level where there are an even number of, of, of investors who think it's worth more and who think it's worth less. So, so it's the same thing. So there's a real market. In football, there are real teams that go out on a real field for 60 real minutes and score real touchdowns and real field goals, and there's a real and one wins score. and one loses. One loses. Yeah. In business, there's a real game where people build factories, sell real stuff for real money, and and there's this expectations game. People watching and determining what they think is going to happen in the future sets a stock price. They determine what they think is going to happen on Sunday, and that sets a point spread. So parallel systems, they operate entirely differently. In business. The theory is we must make the quarterback, the CEO, invest in and will compensate them on the basis of, of uh, the stock price. In football, what do they say? If you ever get involved in betting on football in the expectations market, you're kicked out of football for life. Yeah. You know, for, for life. Uh, for, for, for the obvious reason, that yeah. you'd be tempted to uh, to manipulate the game so that you you uh, favored whatever edge of the spread you were betting on. Or exactly. Against, right? yeah, yeah, exactly. They're going to queer Isn't the game. Isn't it so clear? So, it's yeah. so clear when he puts yeah. it that way. So. <laughs> yeah, and so 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 I, I often ask audiences, so what, why is it that we think that quarterbacks and general managers and coaches would act completely differently than than uh, than C CEOs and board members and 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 other executives. So much so that in one case we say you have to engage in this activity, i.e., we're going to make you own stock and have your stock company. So you have to. It's not like maybe you probably should or you have to. And then on the other we say, no way, absolutely not. If you ever do it, uh, you're uh, you're out of here. And and so I think the, the NFL on that front, some other fronts not so much, is smarter than the, uh, than the capital markets. And we are getting in the capital markets exactly what the NFL uh, fears, which is tanking and point shaving and all things that mess up the, the real game. Um, I, I found the elegance of that explanation really striking as a designer. But then as a designer, I find myself wondering, um, you know, I, what this even compared with some of the other things we've talked about, you know, uh, widespread epidemic diseases, global warming, um, the collapse of governments, uh, the education system. This the, this problem seems really remote to me. You know, I'm not an SEC compliance officer. I don't sit on any compensation boards. Is there good for you? <laughs> thank you. Um, um, does it? Um, is there something that like um, like regular people need to? I mean, what you know? What what hope have we to affect all this? It, it's it's a it's a toughie, I think. But I, but actually, I think there are 
there are ways everybody sitting in the room can, and w and one is through through your pension funds. To the extent that you have, that you are in an organization that has that that has a pension fund, it turns out that pension funds, which take care of your money, uh, are actually betting. Well, you know, they're playing for the wrong team. They're betting the wrong way. So pension funds are the ones who say. Uh, when they vote their proxies, and they, they're, they're the biggest owner of, of, uh, of shares, like the biggest uh, 50 US pension funds own uh, $11 trillion worth of, uh, uh, worth of securities, um, you should be encouraging them to not uh, support this system. They are. They're, they're, they're doing two really bad things. One is they vote for more stock-based compensation, and two, they give money to hedge funds uh, who, who just are interested in, uh, in manipulating volatility and what pension funds should be caring about is stock markets uh, going up over, over time. And in fact, uh, pension funds, this is, this is the thing that stuns and amazes me. So this, in the obscure world of pension funds, they, one thing that pension funds do is they lend stocks so if you've got stocks in your portfolio, which pension funds do, they can lend them on a short-term basis to, to folks and they earn a little fee for lending. The folks that they're lending them to are short sellers because it turns out to short a stock, i.e. to bet that the stock is going down, you need to borrow a share so that you have it so that you can guarantee that you will be able to make delivery on, on that, uh, on that uh, stock when you, when you short sell it. Short selling, right, reduces stock prices. It's a bet against stock prices. So here are these pension funds who have the majority of their portfolio in stocks that they want to go up so that they can pay you your pension, betting, supplying the way for these hedge funds to bet against them. So I think the, the pension fund world needs, needs some serious kind of fixing and it's pressure from pensioners, future, future pensioners, uh, that I think uh, can make a difference. Um, this, this, uh, this talk about this really short-term thinking, in, in this case you're talking about millisecond short thinking Absolutely. in some cases, right? Um, leads me to another uh, kind of line of questioning about this, which is yesterday Phil Gilbert was here from IBM and um, sh you know, talked a little about IBM's history, and particularly IBM's history under Thomas Watson Jr. Yeah. when he brought in first Elliott Noyes and then uh, Charles and Ray Ames and Paul Rand and Eero uh, Saarinen and these amazing designers that kind of created a real design culture around IBM. That really took time and trust and an investment that couldn't have possibly been proven you know, uh, you know, by, the, by the end of the quarter in which it was commissioned. No. Right? So somehow this thinking is all making the people in this room who care about design and who care about sort of seeing design have an impact on business, it's somehow playing directly against that, isn't it? Yes, it is. And, and it's really this, this notion that, and, and again, uh, unfortunately my friend Mike Jensen was, was part of this, this notion of saying the, the way that we will determine the, the merit of a company is on the basis of today's stock price. And are there companies today that don't do this? Yeah, I would, I would say they're, they're coming, like uh, Google's a good example, which uh, I, I love the Google attitude. They, they, when they went public, they said, so here's the deal. Um, you know, we are never going to give, give you guidance. We couldn't care less what happens uh, this quarter. We're gonna run a good company, and if you don't like it, here's an idea for you. Don't invest, yeah. right? Uh, and, and, and Paul Pullman at Unilever yeah, yeah. recently did that. He, he, said, he said to his, uh, the investors, here's the deal. We have to manage this company for the, for the long term. Uh, I'm going to give you the absolute minimum amount of information on the company in the short term that's regulatorily required and not announce more. Uh, and if you don't like that, please get out of the stock. Mm -hmm. and the stock did go down te temporarily as some people exited and said, I don't like that attitude. Uh, I like it. but." <laughs> a good friend of mine, I, 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 uh, but, but the, then different investors came in, and if you talk to Paul now, he, he would say there are a bunch of investors who, who, who want a company that operates like that. So I think a lot of, a lot of CEOs literally are like the, like the you know, person who kind of goes into the jail cell, locks the door behind it, throws the keys on the other side of the room, and then starts you know, you know, <laughs> grabbing at the bar saying, let me out of here, let me out of here. I yeah. Well, you know, you put yourself uh, 
you put yourself in it. So I think you have to be super clear with the capital markets how, how you're going to operate the company so that you get shareholders who are interested in, in managing uh, that way. And in your book, you talk about um, uh, not just uh, uh, not just like investment design, but investments of all sorts suffer. Investments in social responsibility and long-term well-being of employees, all of that kind of isn't just showing up in uh, quick uh, profits or pay, plays into volatility. Yeah. In way, so. No, absolutely. And, and one of the things that, that is, is a, uh, I think, an unhelpful sort of framing of this, so lots of people say you shouldn't focus completely on shareholder value and profits you should sort of um, kind of ameliorate your demands there so that you can do all of these other social things. I think that is a classically false trade-off, hmm. right? One of the things I point out in my, in my work is that ever since there's been a higher focus on shareholder value maximization, again, that's only in the last 30 years has that terminology even been around, uh, we must maximize shareholder value. Shareholder returns over that period have been consistently lower than they were before with more volatility. So investors have to pay in terms of more volatility to get lower returns, 15% higher volatility, 15% lower returns. And so I think the great fallacy is, is if you pursue shareholder value, I think you'll get less shareholder value. Mm -hmm. It's like Aristotle, right? Said, you know, if a or man sees or, or dating. Dating, yes, you, yes. If you act desperate, you sort yes. of, it's repellent, I understand. No, 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 I, I think that's, that's what I've told right. myself all along, yeah, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> but Aristotle said this, right? He said, if, if a man seeks to be happy, he talked about man, if a man seeks to be happy, he's unlikely to end up happy. If yeah, he yeah, seeks yeah. to live a virtuous life, it's yeah. more likely to be happy. I think the exact same thing applies to corporations. If you don't pursue shareholder value maximization, but instead pursue serving your customers brilliantly, taking care of your people, taking care of the communities in which you operate, I think you'll do better. And J&J, &J, by the way, Johnson Johnson is an example. They have that carved in granite in their, in the, in their lobby. It, it was Robert Wood Johnson who, who, who said in 1948, I'll paraphrase, our, our customers come first, uh, our employees come second, the communities in which we operate come third, and he, and he didn't say fourth, he said, and last, last are the shareholders. Mm. However, if we do a good job for the first three, the shareholders will earn a fair return. Mm -hmm. Now, at that, when he went public, Johnson Johnson was a tiny company, it's now one of the top 15 companies in shareholder value in the world, and the way he did it is by saying, you people are, you know, you're at the end of the line. Good luck to you, but if we take care of that, we'll win. So, so I, I'm, I think companies just have to say, ask themselves the question, and this is the designerly question, I think, right? Mm. Is, is what is the design of an operating system? What is the design of a strategy that will produce the outputs we want, not this sort of, this sort of simplistic if we say we're, we're for shareholder value, we will. Because look at IBM. Mm -hmm. I mean, IBM has said incredibly clearly over the last five to seven years, we're into shareholder value. Ginny Romney, when she came in, said we're going to deliver this many billion do dollars to shareholders by, by 2015. What's she saying now? Yeah. Can't do it. Oh, I wonder why. I wonder why we can't do it. It's because you were trying to do it. Yeah. It's just like you're trying to get the date. Yeah. <laughs> I was trying to get the yep. date. Um, from a design point of view, like it's, I've got, as uh, Nathan, among many others, uh, credits you as being one of the people that actually popularized the idea of design thinking. Um, d uh, during this conference, I've heard at various times, um, it's said that anyone can be a designer. People are brought into rooms and kind of they're empowered to kind of co-create things and they're designers. And I'm also, I've also heard that uh, um, nearly every human activity is sort of described as being designed. So if everyone is a designer and everything that all those people do is design, what meaning do those words have anymore? Uh, yeah, I think, I, I think they end up having almost none, <laughs> uh, is my view. And, and I'm, I, I'm, I think that any, anybody can develop their design capabilities. 
but I do not believe that walking into the, that post-it notes automatically make one a designer. Um, I, I, as, and, as 3M stock just starts yeah, yeah, to plummet, plummet on the news. So, yeah. so, so I have a, I have a, I have a, a, a wonderful designer uh, co-author that I work with named Hillary Austin, yeah. uh, uh, who, who you've, uh, you've met, and, and she makes this great distinction. She, she, what she says is, is in, you know, kind of in the world, you need to be able to do a couple of things. You need to be able to manipulate quantities Right? So you, there are things that are numerical and you have to figure out how to manipulate them and we learn all about that. Addition is the manipulation of quantities. Calculus is the manipulation of quantities. Mm -hmm. But she said what's equally important is growing your appreciation of qualities. Your ability to, to make fine distinctions mm -hmm. in qualities. And what she says is, she says is you don't go into an art museum and say, I saw, I, mm, that was a great show. I saw 270 square feet of paintings today, right? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's manipulation of quantities, adding up how many square feet of paintings. It's, uh, it's appreciating uh, uh, small differences. So yeah. what I think, Michael, is that the modern uh, educational system is tilted ridiculously toward manipulation of quantities. And I think this, this whole STEM thing, where, where all kids are now, are now kind of tortured with this notion that they will end up a, you know, a bag lady or a hobo unless they, they go into one of the STEM disciplines, is exactly the opposite way to make uh, America competitively strong. I think we need to rebalance the manipulation of quantities and the appreciation of qualities. And, and you know, I, you know if, it, if it was mine to wave a magic wand, you would not be allowed to drop art one you know, year earlier than you're allowed to drop drop math. Uh, instead, you can you can it's unhelpful. You can throw it overboard yeah. immediately. Well, we're 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 producing uh, uh, people who I don't think have the capability to be designerly automatically yeah. by going into the room with the post-it notes because being a designer, I think, is all about uh, about uh, being able to appreciate at a really fundamental level. Uh, uh, qualities. Um, the, 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 that goes back to something, my favorite moment of the conference so far actually was when uh, Joel Poldoni was describing from uh, Apple. For one thing, I appreciate that he did not do an Apple commercial, so tempting to have done it, but he did not, good for Joel. Secondly, um, he showed um, uh, a little bit from a uh, course uh, that a colleague of his teaches at Apple University, which is called, I think, The Course on the Best Things. And it was that little filmed excerpt of Glenn Gould in the recording studio. Um, listening to playback of two different performances of one of the variations and the Goldberg variations. And first he listens to one and he goes, no, no, no it's, it's, it's awful the way it is. And then, then he listens to the next take and he says, ah, that's perfect. See that? It's perfect. It's perfect. And, um, and then there's this fantastic actual statistical analysis, as you recall, where it's four decibel difference, right? And I found myself thinking, you know, if you know anything about Glenn Gould, like, Talk about design thinking. He's like a terrible design thinker. He was like not collaborative at all. He was extremely willful and private. He had no empathy, seemingly. Uh, he purposely hated audiences and had no, <laughs> didn't care at all what they thought about his playing. He was very iterative because he would do, he'd drive his engineers insane by doing like 60 different takes of three measures until he got it exactly right. And it seems like yet, 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 I could tell that that inspired and moved everyone here. And clearly, is a is is a hallmark of uh, of what um, uh, people at Apple look for that ability, as you just said, to distinguish between quality. Very fine. And, yeah, and so um, um, you know, how how do we figure out a way to make that valued uh, um, in the business world and the education world? Well, I mean, it's it's a toughie. I mean, I, to me, that is that more than more than empathy or collaboration or whatever i think the feature of a of a great designer is this this ability to make fine qualitative uh, uh, distinctions um, and interesting enough uh, michael i would say in the greatest ceos i have met that's what distinguishes yeah. them not and so you know i work a lot as i said for Procter and gamble ag laffley his ability to tell whether this ad copy will work mm -hmm. or not or this package is 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 incredibly, he can make very fine, uh, fine judgments. Um, I, I think, I mean, my criticism of the business world is the business world has become, uh, has become far too scientific for its, mm -hmm. for its own good. This has happened from 1960 onward. There's been a move towards greater sort of, uh, you know, prove it. You must prove uh, whether, whether this new idea is going to work. Problem is, 
this you know, turn of the 20th century American pragmatist philosopher, Charles Sanders Peirce said, mm, unfortunately, no new idea in the history of the world has ever been proven in advance <laughs> uh, analytically. So yeah. uh, you got a bit of a problem here if you say the only new things we're gonna do are the ones you can prove. So, so I think a huge part of the business world has to simply accept that, that that is a feature of life on the planet. The only way you will ever do something new, something great that hasn't been done before, like the way Glenn Gould played piano. I mean, he wasn't exactly copying people last time I checked. He was, <laughs> he was, he was charting in his own course, and he was charting in his own course because he said, I think this is a good course. Yeah. Now. That was backed by a lot of depth of skill and understanding uh, of his world and his medium. Uh, so it was a bet worth making. But if there was somebody there, the, the, the you know, piano playing god saying, unless you can prove it, Glenn, don't, don't go doing that uh, stuff in front of audiences. You gotta prove, the, prove it first. We would, have, we would have never had that. And I think that's the, the case in the world of business. And that's why we love Steve, Steve Jobs so and, much, and that's the premise. That's the struggle that I think every designer faces. You know, you um, you're trying to prove something that's never been seen before, and it seems impossible at times. But you're uh, you start the book with a quote from the world of football from Coach Vince Lombardi. Uh, read it out loud. It's beautiful. <laughs> I will have to put my glasses <laughs> on to to, uh, to read. It's it very out. simple. Yes. We would accomplish many more things if we did not think of them as impossible. So there you have it. Um, everyone, the book is Fixing the Game. The author is Roger Martin. Thank you, Roger. Hey, pleasure. Pleasure. That was great. Thank you.